On this week's episode of the Screen Lawyer Podcast, my guest is Ron Waterman, founder and CEO of StorySmart, a filmmaker's storytelling service that helps people tell their stories on screens. It's pretty cool. Check it out. Hey there. Welcome to the Screen Lawyer Podcast. I'm Pete Salsik, the Screen Lawyer. And my guest today is Ron Waterman. Ron is the founder and CEO of StorySmart, a filmmaker's storytelling service that helps people tell their stories on screens. Ron, welcome. It's awesome to be here. Well, thanks, man. It's great to have you here. This is going to be fun. This is fun. you got a really cool setup here. Well, you know, we're trying it's, it's here the, for a little, real little, deal. Uh, little screen lawyer studio. We're working on it, and it's great to have you here, and it's great to have somebody like you who has spent a lot of time behind the camera, in front of the camera, behind the radio mic, in front of the radio mic, and just all the different times you've spent sort of in this storytelling world. Tell yeah. us about that. You know, I mean, we're living in an exciting time where the communication landscape is, is changing so quickly yeah, and absolutely. I mean you guys are really living sort of one of my fundamental values which is that every every person every organization really is their own media outlet um, yeah, capable that's of telling really their good, own yeah. story and reaching their own audience directly and that's that's actually why I founded Story Smart because I I wanted to bring kind of what I learned when I was with the St. Louis Cardinals right. and the insights I gained there you know I realized like with the Cardinals I mean heck they're they're a mega power in terms right. of marketing and communication and their ability to connect directly with their audiences right. you know it's 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 incredible there's 13.7 yeah. million people that go to their website every month during the baseball season that's wild um, and wow. so yeah so you can be your own media outlet and that's that's sort of what I learned when I was there and I I've tried to bring that to to story smart well and what I think is really cool is that the the when we've talked about your business and we'll get more into this is that it you don't have to be somebody that's got 13.7 million website visitors to do this. Right. You can have no right. website visitors and get started yes. by telling yes. your story, right? Yes, and, and, absolutely. You know, companies like yours make it more accessible, where it used to be, you know, just it wasn't even available to most of the world. Well, where's the first place you go when you're curious about a person or a business? You go to Google. Right, yeah. like you, you, you know, you, you. If you're interested in a business, you're going to go to their website. Right. And you're going to make some um, assessments based on right. what their website looks like. You're going to look at their social media, and what are they saying about themselves? Right? Yeah. Who's the ultimate authority on you? You, right? Yeah, like, I mean, that's, that's it. Really, I, like, that's, that's that, I like from that. my vantage yeah. point, that's always been it. And you know, that was sort of the the you know, I would make these you know arguments to build a wit, the president <laughs> of the Cardinals. I'm like, look, you know, we were set up to help the media right. cover us so that our fans would know about us. Right. But the reality is our fans were going directly to our website and our social media every single day. Yeah. And what were we doing to put our story out there? Right. Um, and, and to keep them fresh, to keep them yes, coming back. Yes. So it's not the same every time they yeah, Exactly. Right. If people are interested in the bacon wrapped hot dog, where are they gonna go? Right. <laughs> like, you know, so you know, I was a big I'm proponent of mm, yeah, it does sound sounds good. good. Everything's does. better with bacon. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, at the end of the day, that's that's really sort of what Story Smart's about. It. Yeah. And and what, you know, my my personal mission uh, is to is to help people tell yeah. their own story. Um, I believe everybody matters and uh, deserves to have their story yeah. told. Yeah. Uh, in the most powerful way. And the reality is it's not just the story, it's the storytelling that is so important, right? Yeah. Like you, anybody so can, what do you explain that? What do you mean by that? The, the telling is because this, the story is the story, right? These are the things that happen. Yeah. What? Well, it's 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 the difference between my, my, my son Charlie, when, I, when he comes home from school, I ask him how his day was. He's good. <laughs> right? Like, well, that's not much of a story, right? Right. right? But if he wants to tell me about what happened on Fortnite, right. you know, he'll go into great detail and embellish and really tell the yeah. story. And, and I see that in the world of publishing, right? Like anybody can publish a book these days. Uh, and I bought self-published books before. Um, and sometimes they're good. Yeah. Uh, but that's often not the case. Like the writing right. is not good. Um, and I believe that, you know, like when a celebrity writes a book, they usually hire a ghostwriter, yeah. right? Yeah. Who knows how to write a book. Uh, and they interview them and right. they develop the manuscript together. And when, you know, like I just read on vacation, uh, Shoe Dog, uh, the story of the founder of Nike, Phil Nike. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it was written by J.R. Moringer. Uh, who's sure, one of the most of prolific ghostwriters around. Yeah. Uh, and it's beautifully written. 
Um, and, you know, it's still under the copyright of Phil Knight, yeah, right? Like right. It's, 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 yeah, absolutely. They had yeah. a nice work for hire contract exactly. in place. Exactly. Remember that right, right. Hire. Well, and that's that's the premise with Story Smart is we want to be sort of the ghost writer for it, your on screen story. We want to bring in a professional. We think a professional filmmaker will do a better job um, telling your story on screen than you would doing it yourself. Got it. But that's it's it. still your story. It's still your right. story. It's, it's still a work be, for hire. You own right. the copyright on it. You know, one of the things that I believe fundamentally is everybody is their own media outlet and they need to think and act like a media yes. outlet. And one of the, look at all the major media players, they own the copyright right. on their content. Right. The New York Times is a story about you. They own that, yeah, right? Absolutely. Like, you know, they take your photo, they own right. that photo. Right. Uh, and you know that's that's one of the things that we realized that we weren't doing exactly right at the Cardinals. Okay. We, we needed to own that. You know, like we we would spend a lot of money on photography, and we didn't have the right agreements in yeah. place. And we made yeah. sure that going forward we did right. so that we own those images. Um, right. And we flip the relationship that typically exists when right. you like when my son gets his photos taken at school. It's the photographer that owns the photos, right. and I have to get a release to right. take it. To, and you have to pay them. And yeah. Right. right. Exactly. exactly. Right. Um, well, and that, I think that. That's, that's an interesting reminder that, you know, because we, we I see this in my practice all the time, where businesses, people, professionals who have been very successful putting things onto screens for many years in various different ways or creating content don't always get the copyright stuff right. There's some right. fundamental misunderstandings that just sort of are pervasive about the relationship between who, well, I paid them. Well... Paying them isn't the deal. Was there something in writing that said work for hire? Yeah. You know, and a lot of times people don't necessarily think through what are the implications of being the copyright owner. They just want to know if they can use the stuff. Right. But to your point, right. if you are approaching it as you are your own media outlet, you as an individual, you as a business, whatever, well, what does ownership mean? Is ownership something that you would value? Is there some way that this content has a market that you want to be able to participate in as the copyright owner. Correct. You know, things like that. Just And help. sometimes it's not even about making money with it. Sometimes it's just being able to use it, right? Like sure. without being in trouble. Uh, or to say yes or no to someone else's ability to use it. Right. 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 To be able to control that, where yes. it's going. Yes. I mean, and, and you know from years of, of with the Cardinals working with Major League Baseball and the rights, what it licensing. takes to get licensing yes. rights to use team logos and even the picture of the stadium and things like that. It's remarkable. Yeah, I'll never forget. Uh, we did this. I, I, one of the things I love to do is these fan engagement campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that we did was Stand for Stand, which was an effort to right. try to get Stan Usual the Medal of Freedom. Um, and we did a paper doll, and you could yeah. print off the paper doll and take a picture of yourself with it. And right, I remember it, that. It, it was all that. to try to get the attention of yeah. the president to to award him the medal. And it worked. And it worked, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, really, it was wildly successful <laughs> right. beyond my imagination. Right. Uh, right. It was the third time was a charm. We had tried it two different times sort of behind the scenes. So so that worked. And we would do these campaigns for yeah. our Hall of Famers. And what I really liked about that was trying to link these generations of fans, you yeah. know, young fans, yeah. like myself. That, you know, I never saw Stan Usual play. Right. I mean, he, he, you Same. know, you know I, 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 I was familiar with him. But, sure. I, you know, so, so we did this campaign for Whitey Herzog. And um, it was um, Cards Rat Pack, hashtag Cards sure. Rat Pack. And we hired Line Forge Labs uh, right. sure. uh, to Great do company. an animated series that told his story. Um, it was a cartoon series. Right. And our general counsel was like, neat idea, Ron. <laughs> but you're going to have to go get rights of publicity sure. for every person you right. turn into a cartoon. Right, right. Uh, and that was... Um, that was a big right. if, but we did it. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's and that's another great example of how the, the idea, because you've talked about like the copyright with somebody's, if you hire someone and they're doing the video or they're taking your pictures, if you don't have something in writing, they own the copyright as the photographer. Correct. Well, but that only gets half the rights. If Correct. The, if inside that picture are people, those people have rights. Yes. Like, I'll never forget, it was towards the twilight of my time with the, the Cardinals, there was a, a photographer who ended up be having a great career as a fashion photographer, but he got his start um, with the Cardinals. Oh, wow. Um, and Marty Hendon had hired him to take some photos at, at, at some games, and he was coming back to sell us um, uh, the collection. And um, it was one of these things where, like, on his business card, he had a picture of Lou Brock. And uh. I thought to myself, hmm, you know, 
he has the rights. You know, that's yeah. his photo. Right. But if you're using it in marketing, exactly. you, Lou exactly. Brock has. Yeah, you're using yeah. Lou's name, image, yeah. likeness. We, we yeah. call, you yeah. referred it to yeah. the correct legal term, the right of publicity. Right of publicity. Um, yeah. But in reality, now everybody knows NIL. Right. So, name, but image, that's and the same thing. Yeah. So are you using yeah. somebody's name, image, and likeness to for a commercial purpose to promote your business? Well, right. yeah. then you need his permission. Right. Right. Because that's essentially an endorsement. Yeah. Well, yeah. and it's funny, like I, I went to the Clayton Art Fair this weekend and, and I walked through one of the booths was this wonderful artist who did all of these, um, I guess, takes on albums, mm. like music mm. albums. Uh, and, you know, I think in the world of art, you, I, I was going to ask you this question, <laughs> like if, if, if I redo an album and it's a one of a kind yeah. piece of art, I'm OK. Right, but if I do prints, well, of it, that it, it, it and this is great, and we are we are literally evolving through the era of fair use right now with okay. the Supreme Court's decision earlier this summer in the Andy Warhol, yep. uh, Prince uh, paintings case, photography case, in which I thought this was going to be fair use, and this court said no, but it did an interesting analysis of how you look at the same purpose, different purpose, and. What it came down to was that in that case, both the original photography and then Andy Warhol's paintings had both been commissioned to promote magazine articles. Yes. So the court yes. focused on that. Yes. As it the was purpose. a commercial. Yeah, it was a commercial both purpose. Commercial so magazine. Commercial. Exactly. And we're right. focusing. So it's given us new language to look at that. So to your okay. question about, you know, an artist who's creating art one-off pieces inspired by maybe pulling elements of this album and that album and doing something maybe with different types of media or yeah. whatever that may also that may get back to the original uh, what we used to think of the fair use language, which is that's a different purpose. It's it's changing it. It's maybe giving a different message. But you're into these weird arguments. Well, right? I always and see this all the time with the with the Cardinals. You know, we like when we did the All Star Game. We we there was a we created a district. It was I'm trying to think what the district was called, but basically you couldn't guerrilla market. Oh right, right? I remember like that. Was, sure. Yeah. yeah. In fact, and I so, got, so yeah, I had a right yeah. after that. Okay, who got, got caught trouble? inside? Okay, in okay, that I got you. Yeah, so, yeah, so I would have been on the that. other side of that. Where <laughs> with Major League Baseball, and, and they're very careful about, like, you know, you can't just rip off the mark, right? Like, you just right. can't take, you know, the Cardinal logo and put right. it on whatever you want and sell it without paying Major right. League Baseball. Uh, and so um, I would always go into Mike Whittle's office, who was a general counsel, and I'd ask him, I'd say, hey, you know, I saw somebody that right. made a purse, or, right. you know, you, you would people would do all kinds of, right. you know, things with the with the Cardinals logo, and, you know, obviously you don't police, you know, one-off yeah, things. Yeah, right, right. But when I see an artist that's doing things, I'm like, huh. You know, like well, I bought a painting. There's a painting in my house um, that's of the of the ballpark. Uh, yeah, and you know, the painter came in the weekend of the art fair and must have right. painted it. And I was like, oh, cool. It was like it was a it was the side of the ballpark that, you know, somebody from St. Louis wouldn't have painted oh, because right. it didn't have right. the same usual right. statue. But it was the it was the view I had walking from our oh, offices. Oh wow, yeah. It, it, so it, it meant it was particularly it, it meaningful, meaningful to, to me. Right. Yeah, but right. but you, you know, if 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 that person made prints of it and there were cardinal logos in it, well, then I see, think then, yeah. then then the artist might run into yes, issues. And, you're, and you're starting to get into the, so so the original piece of art is what gets analyzed. So the painting, let's say. If you're putting logos and things like that, now you are you better be using those logos in some sort of commentary, some sort of set, whatever, something like yeah. that. But it's not, it's not that you can't ever do it. But the analysis of fair use goes on the first painting. If the first painting is fair use, then selling copies of the first painting is still fair use. Okay, it's like I can write uh, an unauthorized biography about somebody within certain things. A public figure, I don't need their permission. Right, right. I may not have access to all their stories, but still tell what's available publicly. Yeah, interview the facts. other people. Yeah. Those facts. And if I've followed the rules there, then I have that. If I go and sell a lot of copies of that, it doesn't change the first analysis. Gotcha. But if my purpose for the original was not to tell this story, not to paint this picture, but to sell my company or sell my product or something like that. So you go back to yes. what's the underlying, what's purpose, the underlying purpose of the creation yep. of the new yep. work. Yep. And that's where it gets down to. Now, yep. someone might say, well, yeah, the artist is trying to make money. He doesn't want to have to you know, paint houses. He wants to paint pictures. Uh, you know, so you get into these things, and and it's my one of my uh, well, in newspapers, right? Make money on selling the newspaper, of right? course, but they're of in course. a different category. But then they're, they're and, and mostly they're listing facts and things right. like that. So um, 
but yes, it's it's all this, and this comes up regularly. A fair uh, segment of my practice and our practice here in our entertainment group is reviewing, particularly documentaries and reality TV yeah. for fair use. Can this show yeah. up? What is the issue, and how does it work? Um, and obviously, if you are staging a set. Right. You don't get any fair use because right. you chose everything that's in there. But in a documentary, it's different because it's more it's treated more like journalism, right? Than it, 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 versus a scripted show. Well, for, certainly there's a difference between documentary and scripted. But even in a documentary, often you can control the set yep. to some extent. Yep. But you yep. are allowed to sort of take the world as you find it in the larger sense. Gotcha. And and there are some things along those lines. But as uh, as my prof- uh, friend, uh, Professor Yvette Liebsman at SLU Law always says... Fair use is expensive forgiveness. Yeah, you know, because it doesn't really come up until after you've been challenged and right. you're paying you got a lawyers cease and desist letter <laughs> to argue fair use. So the better practice, of course, is to understand clearly where those lines are and to stay inside of getting permissions and yep. licenses and all yep. of that for sure. Yeah, that's one of the things that you know, as we've tried to expand Story Smart around the United States. You know, I've been doing these work for hire agreements mm-hmm. with, with um, filmmakers. Uh, and a lot of them are like, well, why are you doing this? Why don't we just do this when we work for the first time? And I'm like, you know, because I really want to cover off on, yeah. I, I'm selling copyright to my client. Yeah. I need to get you it. You need from, to have it yeah, lined up. That's I so it, good. I need to get it from you. Uh, and you know you'll get a portfolio license unless the client tells us otherwise, right? right? Exactly. Like, you know, at the end of the day, exactly. like, we've been doing a lot of stuff where the client doesn't want us to share. No. So it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. You're, you're paying us. For, you know? This is just for their use or their yeah, family yeah, yeah. or whatever. That's cool. Well, this is so. Let's stop here for a second and go back to before you got into Story Smart. You've talked a little bit about sure. your time at the Cardinals, but lead us into that because you had a very interesting career in the public sector on the legislative side before getting in yeah. with the Cardinals. Yes, yeah, and so you, like me, you got a law degree. I do, I do. So I, I've had career ADD. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I grew up here in St. Louis, went to um, Lindenwood College, um, and graduated with a communications degree. In 1989, okay. uh, did a Coro Fellow program, yeah, which is a leadership program. and public affairs right. program. Landed on the we- Buzz Westfall for County Executive campaign. I was the only person that knew how to use a computer. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I did his campaign finance stuff and was his field director. He won. He became the county executive, and I then became his legislative aide. Okay. And I was his legislative aide, um, and I actually left to go to law school at Mizzou. Okay. Um, and got married, came back, ended up going into the evening program at SLU, finishing while working for Buzz. Right. I was his. I would handle our Jefferson City lobbyist and. and got it. Uh, manage that process, and um, long story short, um, butterfly ballots in Palm Beach County changed my <laughs> career plans. I had planned to be, uh, you know, go be a U.S. attorney, uh, and you know, when you work in politics, it's right. not like you know baseball where you can get traded from the Cubs right. to the Cardinals. Right. You're branded, uh, and. As luck would have it, the Cardinals were looking for somebody with my skill set. They needed somebody that had a diplomacy skill set that could deal with the, you know, we have unique politics in our sure. state, right? Of um, course. So, you know, I, I had, you know, this diplomacy skill set. I could work with anybody regardless right. of their political beliefs. It's kind of a dead art, actually, now. It's a, unfortunately, uh, it's like, it is. need not yes. apply, we right? Could, we could yeah. use a lot more of that, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, but... You know, they, they the Cardinals, Mark Lamping, hired me. My first day was 9-11. Um, I was oh hired gosh. to coordinate the lobbying effort to get the ballpark built. And um, it was only supposed to be a short-term project. Right. Um, it ended up being 17 years of my life. Wow. Um, you know, and uh, Mark left, went to work for the Giants and Jets. Bill DeWitt became president. And my career just evolved within yeah. the organization. I at, at first, I was very laser-focused on, let's get this ballpark deal done. Right. Um, and then I was the in-house counsel on the Mitchell investigation oh, uh, into right. performance the enhancing steroids. substances. Yeah, that's right. Which, by the way, there's a great documentary on Netflix uh, that you should check out. I uh, can't think of the name of it right now, but it's about the guy who uh, ran Balco. Uh, oh, wow. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I've been texting some of my friends at the Cardinals. you got to check this thing out. Uh, anyway, uh, I did that for a while. And then um, Mo and Bill came to me. Well, Bill came to me and said, we want you to coordinate the All-Star Game. And after that... Was that 2009? That was 2009. Yeah, and that. that's when I really was introduced to all these people at Major League Baseball. And that was such a wonderful project yeah. for me because I was able to bring to bear kind of what I had learned over those years within the organization um, and then bring together my civic you know, right, community. Right. Right. Uh, background. And then after that, they said, look, we think, you know, there's this you know, social media is emerging. Um, 
you know, we really think you're good at PR and we're going to move you over to baseball operations and we want you to learn the baseball communications. And at that point, you know, we were really set up to just do credentialing mm. and game notes, um, but we really weren't, we didn't have a strategy when it came to social media um, and certainly not you know, with using our website. And the, right. and, the, and the team doesn't actually own the interactive rights. Um, it's actually owned by Major League Major Baseball. Major League Baseball, yeah. Um, which is, in a way, it's a good thing because it's elevated all 30 clubs. Well, that's probably true. I hadn't really thought about that. I know that the professional sports leagues, and they're all a little bit different. I know that the National Hockey League, for example, works on a different type of yes. joint ownership but multiple licensee kind of model. Yes, and soccer is completely different. Soccer's, it's a collective. It's yeah. actually, they're, they're shareholders. They're yeah. not actually, there's really, no individual ownership of teams. I, I, I had a chance to work on some some naming rights deals a couple years ago for some of the new MLS teams and trying to figure out all the little carve outs of what yeah. what what it means when they go over here in this league and that thing and this thing and yeah. were, it's it was wild. Oh, uh, it's totally so hard different. to understand. Yeah. It's so different than yeah. yeah the model of baseball or the NFL. Right. So uh, so you had to learn that space and understand how that all works from a rights yeah. holder perspective. Well, and and, and 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 you know it's funny it, things it's sort of evolved like you know Bill became president and he handed off the photography. To to me to manage uh, and you know we would do these contracts and then you know nobody really managed the photographers so, right, like, it right. was kind of a it was kind of yeah, an they internal... had credentials they go down they carry their big cameras they get yeah. out of the way they license well no I'm stuff. talking about the ones that worked for us I mean um, we 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 had people that were photographing oh, okay, the game okay. and um, the person who ran our so for the so, so for the sort of the team media side of thing not the network media yeah. not the journalism yeah yeah so 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 you know probably the thing that I'm most proud of that no one knows about it. The Cardinals um, or it, fans don't know about is we ended up building a digital archive, mm. um, which is now actually part of what I do with Story Smart. Ironically, um, and it was all born of this fact that we were spending a lot of money on photography, but we couldn't right. produce a photo right. to save our lives. Like if somebody right. from ESPN reached out, I'll never forget. It. After we built our archive, um, ESPN um, sent an email saying, "Hey, do you have a picture of Joaquin Andahar?" Oh, wow. uh, and the team was out of town, um, and I, you know, sent a. I forwarded the message to our photography coordinator, and he was able to send a digital image yeah. to uh, to ESPN for whatever story they were working on. And before we had an archive, somebody would have. This was when the team was out of town. So right. I would have had to driven down to Bush Stadium, oh, dug right. through <laughs> like an old file cabinet, scan right. the photo, and then right. it would have never happened, right? right? Like, right. It, uh, and um, so we, we we ended up putting you know, really everything in this digital asset management system. Yeah. And we were spending a lot of money on that. And at the same time, you know, I got moved over to um, uh, PR, started to build what is the communications department, was promoted to VP. And I was really into this idea of being a media outlet. Yeah. And, you know, it would start with me when the flip cams were a thing. Before the mm -hmm. iPhone, I would shoot videos and some of my colleagues would shoot videos and we would we would post them to the website and yeah. share them on social media. And that evolved into me producing a weekly television show, right. Cardinals Insider with Isaiah right. Smith. That was that we distributed to 18 over-the-air television stations. Right. Uh, and, and that's also that's the one when I always know there's a rain delay because then I turn it on. Yeah, and so there's Cardinals an episode Insider. of that. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, okay, yeah. we're going to see several episodes of this until the rain clears. Yeah, and... And, you know, it's funny, like, uh, it was, I never really set out to do a TV show, but it just sort of evolved that way. Natural like, progression. Right? Natural it's progression. Yeah, yeah. It's like, we need to be sharing our own story. We need to be sharing things right. on Facebook, on our website. You know, we would post a video about Yachty on Facebook and get 500,000 views. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was crazy. And that's a real audience, right? Like, and you need yeah. to think about, as a business, you need to think about all of your ways channels of communications and it's two ways like yeah. you know you gotta be listening too. like well that's a huge part of it yeah, yeah. i mean it's it's it, you know because a lot of times we think in like in, in, in my world i you know i'm behind this truly behind the screens like before the screens you know we're doing the contracts right we're getting the maybe it's the financing in place or the structure of the rights holders and then all of the contracts that deal with the process of capturing the copyright and then getting it ready for distribution but so that's sort of a one we're delivering you the, the camera's going out that way the screen's going out right. and nobody's talking back but while that's happening there's almost always a PA or somebody capturing behind the scenes footage yep. there's other things and it's all part now of a coordinated publicity campaign to tease out this and it's highly regulated in our contracts we're very very clear like you coming on set you can't get your camera out and take pictures Right, you're okay. a, you're in a yeah. appearing. Yeah, you can't do that. Right, this is ours. But we are going to have people doing that. We had to do that with yeah. our employees at the company. Oh, sure, we had I'm to make sure. sure that like, hey, don't be 
you know, like exactly. they, somebody would post something on their own social media, right. and, and then suddenly our phone would ring in the PR department, and right. the media and was we're, we're exactly. following. Our and that's people. and that's what it obviously yeah. that's that's important and, and needs to be careful to, too. Often in a like in a lot of productions, you know, there's a there's the audience is the whole point of it is to su- surprise the audience when you have the finished product. Yep. You know, the audience is going to see something for the first time. Your beginning, middle, and end. Your character, whatever it is. And so if people are leaking out, oh, so-and-so dies, you know, that kind right, of ends right, that right. Uh, a little bit. So, Well, you know, it's funny. When we started doing Cardinals Insider, we had an internal debate within my department about sharing things. So, like, one of the things that I was, you know, very adamant about is whatever we would do, we would repurpose. Sure. Right. We'd, we'd share it on Facebook. We'd share it on the website. We'd put it on TV. We'd put it everywhere. Right. Um, because mostly because I was wanting to justify our existence, <laughs> right. you yeah. know, for the resources we were getting. Right. Yeah. I, I could show our CFO. It's like, OK, this is how many right. views it received. Right. right? Uh, but we debated whether or not, like, if a segment was going to be in the show, do we wait until the show gets aired mm. before we share it right. on Twitter or Facebook or whatever? Right. Uh, and you know, all, you know, we there's robust debate about it. And I finally called a couple of the TV stations, the assignment editors, and they said they just laughed. They're like, "We had those debates too, right? <laughs> Different audiences, you know. Sure. It's like just get it out there. Don't worry yeah. about it. You're not yeah. gonna, you know. Well, and I think that's it. If, if at the end of the day, if your goal is to let people know that Christian Family Night is coming up, then then, then get, get it out there. Get it out there. And also, you know, some more people might be inclined to watch the show if they've seen the little clip. Ooh, I'd like to hear more of this interview. Right. Or that's kind of cool, or whatever that little snippet, you know that that sort of teaser. So come on in, listen, yeah. check out the whole. Pro- I mean, we we'll do a version of this. We did a little, few little teaser recordings, and we'll repurpose some of that as yeah. we promote this episode, right? Because I want right. people to multiple chances to interact with it, and maybe at least one of them they'll click and watch the whole thing. Well, you know, it's funny, like the TV stations, you know, like I don't really watch the news anymore. But I do check my apps. Sure. So I'm watching segments on my phone. All day long. All day long. Right. Right. And on my computer. So like at the end of the day, that's, you know, if if you're thinking about it as a, as a business, it's like, where, where's my audience? Well, and yeah. And I would imagine for most of the stations, their audience is not sitting on their couch at 10 o'clock anymore. No. It's, it's whatever it's throughout the day. And you're right on the apps and everything. I think it's fascinating how it's, how it's evolved. And now you've evolved again with story smart and we kind of talked about the overall principles, but give us a little example. Like how would someone like, what's an example of a, do you have a project you can talk about or, sure. um, we're going to be doing a, a, a a story for an 82 year old woman, um, who we're going to help tell her story, her life story. Um, and we have a shoot at her home, uh, on Monday, um, I have two journalists, um, a 32-time Emmy Award winner who will wow. interview her, um, and will produce basically a mini documentary for her family. Wow! Um, and you know that's so just a very personal, very personal. Yeah. Like, look, I, I lost my dad as a boy when I was five, right. and I was always haunted by not knowing him. And yeah. when family members would talk and tell stories, I would, you know, I would be riveted. Right. And so all storytelling, you know storytelling can be personal it doesn't it's not always about reaching a big audience so that's really my that where my passion is with story smart is that i really want to help families and individuals tell their story in a powerful way that's relevant to their loved ones um so that's one area of our business um i started down the path of really trying to help businesses yeah um you make take advantage of the internet and social media right. and so I scaled Story Smart so that we have great people in all all across the United yeah, States yeah you've got like a whole help. network of people that and you that was, team up that's wherever yeah very much the value driven affordable right. storytelling uh, not video production but storytelling right. there's a distinction between those two things but the area that I'm really growing Story Smart into is the longer form documentary filmmaking and, and going after celebrities and right. people who have compelling stories right. that could be sold to a streaming service right. and be distributed. Um, uh, and you know we're about to execute on a proof of concept with, uh, with a Major League Baseball Hall of Famer. And I'm really excited about that because I look around and I'm like, you know, we've lost some of our yeah. Hall of Famers here in St. Louis. Yeah. And I'll never forget, um, just to bring it all together, Lou Brock was my favorite player as yeah. a boy. And um, I remember the first time I went to a game, it was shortly after my dad had passed and it was my neighbor who took me. And I thought the they gave out a, they gave out a photo of mm. Lou Brock 
uh, stealing base 157, right? And so, like, that, he would be immediately, he, yeah. he, he be, became my favorite. Um, anyway, flash forward, I'm working for the Cardinals. Um, Lou nearly dies during the offseason. He has his leg amputated. Oh, right. Um, complications right. from diabetes. Right. And um, we design a campaign to honor him. Uh, STL is Lou. And we're going to raise money. We're going to tell his story. We're going to raise money for uh, diabetes research. And um, it's the same year that we start producing Cardinals Insider. Okay. Uh, we took over what was the Cardinal Nation show on Channel 5 and okay. rebranded it. Um, and I actually had somebody who did our social media. She hosted the show. She was fantastic. Um, and that first season, I reached out to his agent and said, hey, can we go and interview Lou at his home? And um, Lou was going to throw out the first pitch. He didn't know that uh, on opening day. Um, and so we go to his house. We're in the man room of his basement. Right? right. Picture like every inch on the wall is covered with memorabilia. Yeah, I can imagine. And we do this wonderful segment with him. And as we're breaking down the equipment and stuff, I ask him, I'm like, Lou, how'd you get into baseball? And he starts to tell this amazing story oh, that I had wow. never heard about how he talked too much in grade school. And the teacher made him do a book report and pick from a book in the back of the classroom. And he picked a book about baseball. And that's actually how he learned oh, about baseball. Oh, my goodness. And he, and he said he did I've never heard that story. Yeah, I never heard the story either. He didn't play organized baseball really until college. He played a little bit in high school, right. got an academic scholarship to college, uh, and was failing chemistry, dropped chemistry, <laughs> picked up PE. The PE teacher said, hey, you're a pretty good athlete. You should go out for the baseball team. Right? He's telling the story. I'm like, I've never heard this story oh my before. Gosh. And you're like, are the cameras on? And, yeah, <laughs> no, the cameras aren't on. And his wife was pulling pictures off the wall, you know, to illustrate oh this thing. Goodness. I go back, I drive back to the ballpark, I go into Bill DeWitt's office and I said, Hear me out. <laughs> right. And I'm sure he's like, okay, run with one of his ideas. I'm like, I'd like to offer Lou Brock the ability for us to preserve his story. I yeah. wanna I wanna take all of the stuff that's in his basement and digitally preserve it. Right. through our archive. He would own it. You know, you can own sure. the, the, the digital asset and sell the physical item. Yeah, and, right, and when absolutely. when these athletes die, well, that's exactly what happens is their family sells the stuff, right? Right. But at the end of the day, memorabilia is memories, right? It's, right. it's, it's memories right. attached to a thing. And that thing has value because a celebrity owned it, right? right. And there's a market out there for that. Um, but the story is really what's valuable right. to the family and to the world. And so... You know, I really wanted us to sit down with the athlete and get their life story because I had never heard that story yeah. before. And Bill DeWitt was like, oh, my gosh, I've never heard that story. Right. He's like, why have we never heard that story? And I'm like, I guess because nobody, nobody ever asked, asked him. Right. right? Like, right. it's like tonight's game, they're not going to ask you about it. If you're going into the Hall of Fame, they're going right. to ask about your career, right? right. They're not going to ask about your childhood, right. right? But that's, to me, that's that's compelling. People yeah. will want to see oh, those absolutely. stories. You know, absolutely. Ozzie Smith's story, uh, Whitey Herzog's story, you name it. Right. People, you know, Bob Gibson's, what an extraordinary yeah. story he okay. has. Um, and, and those stories can get lost to history. And and so what Story Smart is really about is trying to help preserve those stories and That's share so cool. those stories. Yeah. And to the extent that somebody can monetize it, monetize the story. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That, that family may benefit from, you know, grandpa's playing days because right. someone still wants a story. And it should go to them. Correct. That's what grandpa would want. That's very cool. Yeah. And, and, and having worked in the world of politics, you know, the, this idea of controlling your narrative has been yeah. around forever. And when people reach out to me, you know, with whatever situation they're dealing with from a crisis communication standpoint, one of the things that I've learned is tell your own story first. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and when, when um, Tony La Russa decided to have Mark McGuire uh, be his hitting coach, right. I'll never forget, we ended up hiring um, Ari Fleischer. Um, sure. From, the, from um, the the Bush White House, and he helped us navigate getting Mark really? back in, and um, you know we wanted him to own his story, tell right. you, know, you know come clean, and and that that has really stuck with me. Is it's like look at the end of the day, you should be sharing your own story right. directly with right. your audience um, and working with the media. It's not like it's not an either right. or. It's it's no. a both. But really. if you but if you get a chance to tell your story and someone gives you a platform to do it professionally and everything else and it's you getting to do that, then you get a chance to have a counter narrative if somebody's attacking from another way or you get people a chance to get a full picture Correct. that sort of thing. Correct. Yeah. And it's funny because I would see this all the time. The the media that would be dispatched to cover us, the first thing that they would do is they'd go to our website and our social media. They're they're doing research, of course they are. right? Of right. Course they are. right. And I would be in a hearing at the Board of Aldermen, and I'll never forget this. There's you know, the reporter sitting in front of him and he's tweeting, you know, sarcastic comments right. about what Bill DeWitt is saying. 
And I would I would pull Bill aside and say, hey, by the way, reporter, you know, yeah. film that. And so he knew that when he would do the interview, right? Like, yeah. you know, so like that's the world we're in, right? It it's is the very world dynamic. In. It is the world we're in. Yeah. And it's and it's something that's not going to change. Not gonna change. Everybody is walking around. Everybody's a photojournalist right now. Right. You know, um, everybody's a podcaster. Everybody's a po- <laughs> well, if I can be a podcaster, anybody can be a podcaster. That's for sure. Um, but yeah, I know. I mean, it, yeah. and so I, I think that's really cool. It's very empowering. So, well, Ron, first of all, thank you. This has been fantastic. Um, hearing your story, hearing more about Story Smart, um, I definitely want to continue to follow yeah. and hear more as things develop. And, but as you may know, we've talked about this before, one of the things I like to do with my guests here on the Screen Lawyer Podcast is to ask what's on your screen. And the reason I ask this is because I think in the world like you just described, where we all have screens, yeah. we're all filmmakers, we're consumers, we're, we're a little bit all of it. We're gamers. Um, we have screens in our pockets, screens yeah. on our walls, screens yeah. on our laptops we're working yeah. with. And so when I ask that question, I get different answers yeah, because sure. they, the, the brain goes to a particular screen. Yeah. So. Well, well, it, it, well, it depends on the screen. If it's the one at work right now, it's an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> if it's uh, what am I watching, uh, you know, it depends on who I'm with. Like, you know, my yeah. you know my son uh, Charlie and I have been watching Rust to Riches. It's a it, it's actually a show that was born out of a copyright dispute. You should oh. check it out. It's called, it's it's they 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 buy these cars and they turn them into really cool things. Oh, so wow. it's on Netflix. And uh, the that guy one. that runs Gotham Garage uh, got into a. Uh, copyright dispute uh, with Warner Brothers because he made oh, a bad, bad the movie. Right, right, bad right, right, right. Okay, and I then know Netflix, that. they sure. read an article in Variety and, and then so that, came to I know, okay, show. I know this. So, but you so, like the show? All right, yeah, so yeah. That, that and um, uh, last night with with the family, we watched the the Adam Sandler. You know, uh, uh, you're not. You're, you're so not invited to my bat mitzvah. Oh. <laughs> uh, my wife and I are going to watch uh, uh, Virgin River. Just finished Lincoln Lawyer. Uh, I'll watch anything, um, documentary, uh, and, and anything. You know, I like binge watch shows. Yeah. So I have stuff that I watch myself. You know, yeah. They, well, they, we, they, they won't watch British television or foreign you know, anything <laughs> with subtitles. I, I like that. So that I mean, yeah. I think you're. I, I hear that a lot of people, and it's sort of the way in our house. You know, my wife and I, we, we have an open TV relationship, right? Yeah. We have TV shows we date together. Yeah. And she's got hers, and I've got mine, and. Every once in a while, they, you know, yeah, they'll, they, they'll line back up or whatever. But yeah, I um, save things that I'm like, well, well, will Charlie grace us with his presence? Right, right. And then you give <laughs> the it three to of us watch. Yeah, you know. when you find something that maybe everybody, especially yeah. with kids, I remember yeah. that too. Um, well, this is fantastic, Ron. Yeah, thank you this so is much. Fun. Thank you. So we will. Um, everybody needs to check out Story Smart. How can they find you? GetStorySmart.com. Just go to the website. GetStorySmart.com. Well, get smart reference. Yeah, in there exactly. Back in the day. I actually did a video with my son. Do you uh, have, we, we walked <laughs> yeah. through a bunch of clothes. I had him dressed up as Maxwell oh, nice. Smart. Yeah. Uh, That's fantastic. Yeah. Get Story Smart. Do you have somebody named Ninety Nine? No, I don't. <laughs> well, so. I have a dog named Story. All right. Well, there we, okay. That's it. That's well. I think there's a theme. We <laughs> yeah. got a common theme here. Storytelling. Storytelling is magic, and we are so glad to be joined by Ron Waterman. Check out getstarrysmart.com. And if you've enjoyed today's podcast, if you're listening on audio, find us and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching here on our YouTube channel, thescreenlawyer.com, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button down there so you'll get all the latest episodes of the Screen Lawyer podcast. Take care, everybody. Check us out at thescreenlawyer.com. See you soon.